morning, everybody. It is my privilege to bring to you the book of Ruth. <clears throat> Ruth is a wonderful historical account of love, faithfulness, kindness, and redemption. In the book of Ruth, we see a, a microcosm of two people doing what is good and right in the sight of God and man, despite a world around them where others are falling astray. Remember, at this time, it's the time of the judges. Everybody's doing what's right in their own eyes. The story of Ruth and Boaz is a refreshing account after so many episodes of failure, repeated failure. There's hope in this record. There is love in this short story, but it's not just a novella. It's way more than that. The book of Ruth demonstrates what the kinsman redeemer should do, what the promised one, Jesus Christ, will do. In Ruth, we get better than a love story. We get the good news. Humanity gets to look ahead to a future redemption from a tainted origin. My goal in this message is twofold. First off, to simply retell the story with just a very minimal amount of additional color and just enjoy it for what it is, a beautiful love story. My second goal is to look at how this book affirms a critical doctrine that impacts our faith at a fundamental level. So let's go to prayer before we begin. God in heaven, great are you. Your plans go beyond anything we can imagine. You turn heartbreak into joy. You preserve those whom you love. Because of your presence with us, we are blessed. Because you have taken notice of us in our poor state, we are blessed. You have not withdrawn your loving kindness from us, even when we were dead in our trespasses and sins. You have shown the world many kindnesses, Lord, but it has been blessed most supremely through the gift of your Son. We as believers have been blessed even beyond that by the presence of your very own Spirit within us at this moment. May you be blessed this day because you have not left us without a Redeemer. May our Savior's name become famous in Vernonia. May the name of Jesus be on our lips always. It's in his precious name we come today. Amen. The thesis of today's message is only a close relative with the capacity and the capability could redeem us. Okay. okay. Looks like my notes got turned around a little bit. Here we go. As I mentioned, we're going to simply look at the, t the text and just enjoy it for what it is. And I'm going to throw up a couple of slides so you can get some additional color. You can follow along in your own Bible, or you can just listen. And after I finish reading the account, we're going to look at how this theme of the kinsman redeemer supports a critical doctrine. So, chapter 1. Now it came about in the days when the judges governed that there was a famine in the land. And a certain man of Bethlehem in Judah went to sojourn in the land of Moab with his wife and his two sons. The name of the man was Elimelech, and the name of his wife, Naomi. And the names of his two sons were Malon and Kilian, Ephrathites of Bethlehem in Judah. Now, they entered the land of Moab and remained there. Then Elimelech, Naomi's husband, died. And she was left with her two sons. They took for themselves Moabite women as wives. The name of the one was Orpah, and the name of the other, Ruth. And they lived there about ten years. Then both Malon and Kilian also died. And the woman was bereft of her two children and her husband. Then she arose with her daughters-in-law that she might return from the land of Moab. For she had heard in the land of Moab, that the Lord had visited his people in giving them food. So she departed from the place where she was, and her two daughters-in-law with her, and they went on the way to return to the land of Judah. The 
And Naomi said to her two daughters-in-law, Go, return each of you to her mother's house. May the Lord deal kindly with you as you have dealt with the dead and with me. May the Lord grant that you may find rest each in the house of her husband. Then she kissed them, and they lifted up their voices and wept. And they said to her, No, but we will surely return with you to your people. But Naomi said, Return, my daughters. Why should you go with me? Have I yet sons in my womb, that they may be your husbands? Return, my daughters, go, for I am too old to have a husband. If I said I have hope, if I should even have a husband tonight and also bear sons, would you therefore wait until they were grown? Would you therefore refrain from marrying? No, my daughters, for it is harder for me than for you, for the hand of the Lord has gone forth against me. And they lifted up their voices and wept again. And Orpah kissed her mother-in-law, but Ruth clung to her. Then she said, Behold, your sister-in-law has gone back to her people and her gods. Return after your sister-in-law. But Ruth said, Do not urge me to leave you or go back from following you. For where you go, I will go. And where you lodge, I will lodge. Your people shall be my people. And your God, my God, where you die, I will die, and there I will be buried. Thus may the Lord do to me, and worse, if anything but death parts you and me. When she saw that she was determined to go with her, she said no more to her. So they both went until they came to Bethlehem. And when she had come to Bethlehem, all the city was stirred because of them. And the woman said, Is this Naomi? She said to them, Do not call me Naomi. Call me Mara, for the Almighty has dealt very bitterly with me. I went out full, but the Lord has brought me back empty. Why do you call me Naomi? Since the Lord has witnessed against me, and the Almighty has afflicted me. So Naomi returned, and with her Ruth, the the Moabitess, her daughter-in-law, who returned from the land of Moab, And they came to Bethlehem at the beginning of barley harvest. Now Naomi had a kinsman of her husband, a man of great wealth, of the family of Elimelech, whose name was Boaz. And Ruth the Moabite said to Naomi, Please, let me go to the field and glean among the ears of grain after one in whose sight I may find favor. And she said to her, Go, my daughter. So she departed and went and gleaned in the field after the reapers. And she happened to come to the portion of the field belonging to Boaz, who was of the family of Elimelech. Now, behold, Boaz came from Bethlehem and said to the reapers, May the Lord be with you. And they said to him, May the Lord bless you. Then Boaz said to his servant, who was in charge of the reapers, Whose young woman is this? The servant in charge of the reapers replied, She's the young Moabite woman who returned with Naomi from the land of Moab. And she said, Please let me glean and gather after the reapers among the sheaves. Thus she came and has remained from the morning until now. She has been sitting in the house for a little while. Then Boaz said to Ruth, Listen carefully, my daughter. Do not go to glean in another field. Furthermore, do not go on from this one, but stay here with my maids. Let your eyes be on the field which they reap and go after them. Indeed, I have commanded the servants not to touch you. When you are thirsty, go to the water jars and drink from what the servants draw. Then she fell on her face, bowing to the ground, and said to him, Why have I found favor in your sight? That you should take notice of me, since I'm a foreigner. Boaz replied to her, All that you have done for your mother-in-law after the death of your husband has been fully reported to me. And how you left your father and your mother in the land of your birth and came to a people that you did not previously know. May the Lord reward your work and your wages be full from the Lord, the God of Israel, under whose wings you have come to seek refuge. Then she said, I have found favor in your sight, my Lord, for you have comforted me and indeed have spoken kindly to your maidservant, though I'm not like one of your maidservants. At mealtime, Boaz said to her, Come here, that you may eat of the bread and dip your piece of bread in the vinegar. 
So she sat beside the reapers, and he served her roasted grain, and she ate and was satisfied and had some left. When she arose to glean, Boaz commanded his servant, saying, Let her glean even among the sheaves, and do not insult her. Also, you shall purposely pull out for her some grain from the bundles and leave it, that she may glean, and do not rebuke her. So she gleaned in the field until evening. Then she beat out what she had gleaned, and it was about an ephah of barley. She took it up and went into the city, and her mother-in-law saw what she had gleaned. She also took it out and gave Naomi what she had left after she was satisfied. Her mother-in-law then said to her, Where did you glean today, and where did you work? May he who took notice of you be blessed. So she told her mother-in-law with whom she had worked, and said, The name of the man with whom I work today is Boaz. Naomi said to her daughter-in-law, May he be blessed of the Lord, who has not withdrawn his kindness to the living and to the dead. Again, Naomi said to her, The man is a relative. He is one of our closest relatives. Then Ruth the Moabitess said, Furthermore, he said to me, You should stay close to my servants until they have finished all the harvest. Naomi said to Ruth, her daughter-in-law, It is good, my daughter, that you go out with his maids so the others do not fall upon you in another field. So she stayed close by the maids of Boaz in order to glean until the end of the barley harvest and the wheat harvest. And she lived with her mother-in-law. Then Naomi, her mother-in-law, said to her, My daughter, shall I not seek security for you that it may be well with you? Now is not Boaz our kinsman with whose maids you were? Behold, he winnows barley at the threshing floor tonight. Wash yourself, therefore, and anoint yourself, and put on your best clothes, and go down to the threshing floor. But do not make yourself known to the man until he has finished eating and drinking. It shall be when he lies down that you shall notice the place where he lies, and you shall go and uncover his feet and lie down. Then he will tell you what you shall do. She said to her, All that you say I will do. So she went down to the threshing floor and did according to all that her mother-in-law had commanded her. When Boaz had eaten and drunk and his heart was merry, he went to lie down at the end of the heap of grain. And she came secretly and uncovered his feet and lay down. It happened in the middle of the night that the man was startled and bent forward. And behold, a woman was lying at his feet. He said, Who are you? And she answered, I'm Ruth, your maid. So spread your covering over your maid, for you are a close relative. Then he said, May you be blessed of the Lord, my daughter. You have shown your last kindness to be better than the first, by not going after young men, whether poor or rich. Now, my daughter, do not fear. I will do for you whatever you ask. For all my people in the city know that you are a woman of excellence. Now it is true, I am a close relative, however, there is a relative closer than I. Remain this night, and when morning comes, if he will redeem you, good, let him redeem you. But if he does not wish to redeem you, then I will redeem you, as the Lord lives. Lie down until morning. So she lay at his feet until morning, and rose before one could recognize another. And he said, let it not be known that the woman came to the threshing floor. Again, he said, give me the cloak that is on on you and hold it. So she held it, and he measured six measures of barley and laid it on her. Then she went into the city. When she came to her mother-in-law, she said, how did it go, my daughter? And she told her all that the man had done for her. She said, these six measures of barley he gave to me, for he said, do not go to your mother-in-law empty-handed. Then she said, wait, my daughter, until you know how the matter turns out, for the man will not rest until he has settled it today. Now Boaz went up to the gate and sat down there. And behold, the close relative of whom Boaz spoke was passing by. So he said, turn aside, friend, sit down here. And he turned aside and sat down. He took 10 men of the elders of the city and said, sit down here. So they sat down. Then he said to the closest relative, Naomi, who has come back from the land of Moab, has to sell the piece of land which belonged to our brother Elimelech. So I thought to inform you, saying, buy it before those who are sitting here and before the elders of my people. If you will redeem it, redeem it. But if not, tell me that I may know, for there's no one but you to redeem it. I'm after you. And he said, I'll redeem it. Then Boaz said, 
On the day you buy the field from the hand of Naomi, you must also acquire Ruth, the Moabitess, the widow of the deceased, in order to raise up the name of the deceased on his inheritance. The closest relative said, I cannot redeem it for myself because I would jeopardize my own inheritance. Redeem it for yourself. You may have my right of redemption, for I cannot redeem it. Now, this was the custom in former times in Israel concerning the redemption and exchange of land to confirm any matter. A man removed his sandal and gave it to another. And this was the manner of attestation in Israel. So the closest relative said to Boaz, buy it for yourself. And he removed his sandal. Then Boaz said to the elders and all the people, you are witnesses today that I have bought from the hand of Naomi all that belong to Elimelech and all that belong to Kilian and Malon. Moreover, I have acquired Ruth, the Moabitess, the widow of Malon, to be my wife in order to raise up the name of the deceased on his inheritance so that the name of the deceased will not be cut off from his brothers from the court of his birthplace. You are witnesses today. All the people were in the court, and the elder said, We are witnesses. May the Lord make the woman who is coming into your home like Rachel and Leah, both of whom built the house of Israel, and may you achieve wealth in Ephrathah and become famous in Bethlehem. Moreover, may your house be like the house of Perez, whom Tamar bore to Judah through the offspring which the Lord will give you by this young woman. So Boaz took Ruth, and she became his wife, and he went into her. And the Lord enabled her to conceive, and she gave birth to a son. Then the women said to Naomi, Blessed is the Lord, who has not left you without a redeemer today, and may his name become famous in Israel. May he also be to you a restorer of life and a sustainer of your old age. For your daughter-in-law, who loves you and is better to you than seven sons, has given birth to him. Then Naomi took the child and laid him in her lap and became his nurse. The neighbor women gave him a name, saying, A son has been born to Naomi. So they named him Obed. He is the father of Jesse, the father of David. Now these are the generations of Perez. To Perez was born Hezron, to Hezron was born Ram, and to Ram, Aminadab. And to Aminadab was born Nashon, and to Nashon, Salmon, and to Salmon was born Boaz. And to Boaz, Obed. And to Obed was born Jesse. And to Jesse, David. What a wonderful story, right? Two people, two honorable people, doing good things out of love for God and family. The line of the Messiah continued. That's a good story. You'll remember a couple of weeks ago, we talked about Rahab, Joshua, and Jericho, remember? Well, who was Boaz's mama? Rahab. Rahab, the Canaanite from Jericho. This Gentile, Rahab, was the mother of Boaz. Do you think that that great woman of faith, mentioned in the Hall of Faith in Hebrews 11, had something to teach a young Boaz about the faithfulness of the Lord? Do you think she knew a thing or two about redemption? Absolutely. What a heritage. As you know, our sermon series in 2021 is to cover the breadth of the biblical text at a high level with a focus on finding Jesus, where he shows up, either as types or illustrations or examples. Boaz is a wonderful picture of our Messiah. Jesus is our Redeemer, our Protector, our Security, and he is also our human kinsman. This human aspect of Jesus is what I want to focus on right now, his personhood. That's what we're going to explore with the balance of our time. It is of vital importance to our faith that we understand that Jesus Christ is God. Similarly, it's crucial to cling to the fact that he is simultaneously fully human. If we overemphasize one aspect of Jesus over the other, we run an incredible risk, a risk of losing either our confidence that he possessed the capacity to forgive sins as God or his capability to relate to us as a human. He is both 100% human 
and 100% God. There can be no division in these aspects of his personhood. So in this last portion of the message, I'm going to be talking about this important doctrine, the person of Jesus Christ. My goal is to have this part of the message build up our faith in the sufficiency, the completeness of Christ's redemption of sinners. If you recall, uh, the thesis for the sermon is only a close relative with the capacity and capability could redeem us. Sheep, oxen, sacrifices, they need not apply. They, they are not able to redeem humanity. A redeemer, a human redeemer, is what Boaz was for Ruth. And that is what Jesus is for us. Boaz was a special person, like Jesus was a special person. He had a family relationship with Naomi and Ruth, the family relationship that was necessary for redemption. He also had the means, he had the status, he had the capability and the desire to redeem Ruth. That is what Jesus had to be for us. He had to be our closest of close relatives, 100% human, 100% in the fact that he was completely sinless. None of his imago Dei, his imageness, had been deteriorated by sin. He was 100% complete. He had the capability as a perfect human to pay for all sins. However, being 100% human is not enough to redeem, redeem sinful humanity. He had to have the capacity to do so. And that's where we come to the idea of Jesus being 100% God. Jesus is not an either or, God or man. No, he is both and. He is God-man. Uh, maybe uh, most significantly, perhaps, Jesus had to have the desire to do this. The other relative of, of Naomi, the, the other guy that passed on redeeming, he had all those things. He had the capability, he had the capacity, but he had no desire to jeopardize his inheritance. There was an unwillingness on the, on the part of the other relative to sacrifice. Not Boaz. Boaz was willing to sacrifice his standing in the community to redeem Ruth. Jesus was willing to sacrifice, to sever his eternal, constant, unbroken relationship with God to redeem humanity. By faith, we accept this. Some of us, very simply, and I don't want to diminish that in the least, to accept with childlike faith is wonderful. And we aspire to a simple faith that accepts God at his word. But I would contend, I would argue, that an element of maturity, of growth, is being able to explain from Scripture why Jesus had to be both 100% both and, why he had to be God-man to save us. This is the second application point. Be able to argue from Scripture who Jesus is. So, to present an example of what this looks like, I'm going to present a couple of arguments from Scripture. The first argument is what Jesus thought about himself about his personhood. What did he think he was? Did he think he was only man? Did he think he was only God? What did he think about himself? Well, uh, Jesus saw no splitting in his natures. He saw himself as unified with God the Father. Turn with me, if you would, to John 17, or you can just see it up there on the, the board. Jesus, at this time, he's praying to God the Father before he's betrayed by Judas. And he says of the disciples, he prays about them, that they may all be one, even as you, Father, are in me and I in you, that they also may be in us, so that the world may believe that you sent me. The glory which you have given me, I have given to them, that they may be one, just as we are one. In this passage, Jesus speaks of himself in the singular sense, but also as unified with God the Father. So we see Jesus as God here, and that's good. But what about his humanity? Turn with me to uh, Matthew 28. Oh, actually, I've got it up here as well. 
Matthew 20, 28 says, The Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. Uh, in the Gospels, when you look at um, Jesus in the Synoptics and also in, in uh, the Gospel of John, we see Jesus repeatedly using this term, the Son of Man. It's his favorite self-designation, which is so unique and ironic to me. We would think uh, you would come in your laurels. You would come with your reputation. You'd say, I am the Son of God. Do what I tell you. That's not how Jesus came. He came as the Son of Man. Well, we looked at what Jesus thought of himself. Now let's look at my second argument, which is what the people who were closest with him thought about Jesus. In Galatians 4, Paul writes, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, he said that God sent his Son to be incarnated, to be manifested, to be made human. Galatians 4, 4 through 5 says, When the fullness of the time came, God sent forth his Son, born of a woman, born under the law, so that he might redeem those who were under the law, that we might receive the adoption as sons. He was born of a woman. Women give birth to children, human children. They don't give birth to other things. He was 100% God, and he's 100% man. Paul recognizes that. John says that the God-man, Jesus, God-made man, was physically examined by them. They knew he was really human. 1 John 1, 1 through 2 says, What was from the beginning... That was Jesus, what had an eternal past, what was from the beginning, what we have heard, what we have seen with our eyes, what we have looked at and touched with our hands concerning the word of life, that he's talking about Jesus. We actually saw him, and the life was manifested, and we have seen and testified and proclaimed to you the eternal life, which was with the Father and was manifested to us. Jesus is 100% man and 100% God. He's not 50% of each like a chimera. You'll search in vain in the biblical text for any reference that Jesus talked about himself like a split personality. He's one whole person, 100% man and 100% God. He must be fully both at the same time, not switching one nature at at a time when it's convenient for him. He didn't pay for our sins while God alone, and then in an instant, switch his nature for his human one so he could die on the cross. That's one of the historical heresies that has cropped up. That Jesus decided, oh, I'm going to switch. I'm going to be God at this point and then human at this point. No, the Gospels do not support that. If Jesus was a perfect human alone, meaning not God, His sacrifice could not atone for the sins of the world. At best, it would be meaningless. Why die if he's sinless? He had to be both a perfect human and God to atone for the sins of the world. We need the God-man's infinite capacity to cover, to atone, to pay for the world's overwhelming but finite sins. If our faith is based on human Jesus alone, or good teacher Jesus, or nice guy Jesus, and we functionally do not believe he was God as well as man, we have rejected scripture, and we have no saving faith. If we look at Jesus as divine alone, as if you could even say that, he's just God. You couldn't say that. If we look at Jesus as divine alone, if Jesus is just God, how can we ever trust that his intercession as our great high priest is legitimate. That his intercession is fully earnest. We would constantly be wondering if he really actually understood our frailty. We know that he does because he is 100% both God and man. Now, I guess generally speaking, most of us are probably Gentiles here, like Ruth. Okay. Uh, And so I want to try and bring this idea home to us about the state of Gentiles and how miraculous it is that we have been brought into the family of God, like 
Ruth was brought into the family of Boaz. So I'd ask you to open your Bibles to Ephesians 2. Ephesians 2, verse 11. Therefore, remember that formerly you, the Gentiles in the flesh, who are called uncircumcision by the so-called circumcision, called Gentiles by the Jews, circumcision which is performed in the flesh by human hands, remember that you were, at that time, separate from Christ, excluded from the commonwealth of Israel, and strangers to the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. But now, in Christ Jesus, you who were formerly far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. For he himself is our peace, who made both groups into one and broke down the barrier of the dividing wall by abolishing in his flesh the enmity, which is the law of commandments contained in ordinances, so that in himself he might make the two into one new man, thus establishing peace. He might reconcile them both in one body to God through the cross, by it having put to death the enmity. And he came and preached peace to you, that's us, who are far away, and peace to those who are near. For through him we have both our we both have our access in one spirit to the Father, so then you are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are fellow citizens with the saints and are of God's household, having been built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, this is God's word, Christ Jesus himself being the cornerstone, in whom the whole building being fitted together is growing into a holy temple in the Lord, in whom you also are being built together into a dwelling of God in the Spirit. <clears throat> As you can see, this is a fundamental area of doctrine that impacts us at a, at a very foundational level. In summary, to, to wrap up this message, um, my thesis was only a close relative with the capacity and capability could redeem us. We also looked at two good people, Ruth and Boaz, doing what was right in the sight of God and man. We also looked at the personhood of Jesus. We attempted to wrap our heads around the, the fact that Jesus had to be 100% man and 100% God to accomplish our redemption. Otherwise, he couldn't atone for sins. He couldn't redeem us. The Christian's faith the believer's faith rests on the foundation that Jesus is who he says he was. He's 100% God and 100% man. Jesus is our relative. He's our closest of close relatives. He's our kinsman, and he's our redeemer. The unbeliever, the unsaved one, they're adrift. They're like Orpah. They're stuck in Moab, starving Remember the famine? They're apart from the presence of God. They're stuck serving idols. They're cut off. They're unredeemed. That is not what happened to Ruth. She was brought in. Unbeliever, do you sense your need to be made right with God? I have good news. You are utterly incapable of making yourself right with God. You need God to make you right with him. That's what he offers in Jesus. Do you want redemption? Do you want inclusion to be brought into relationship with God by the atonement of Jesus Christ? If you do, that's the Holy Spirit tugging on you. Respond in faith. If you confess with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. I hope this uh, message has been uh, meaningful for you, and that we've had a chance to enjoy the book of Ruth, and also to get a, a handle on what Christ did. Let's stand, and I'll close in prayer.
Father, most of us have had families, and we've been born into families, and we've never been adrift as orphans, apart and lost. But we see here what happened with Ruth, how she was brought in by Boaz. That's what you do for us. You bring us in. You change us. You include us. You bring us into the kingdom of God. And we are so grateful, Lord, that you have done that, that you didn't just leave us stuck and starving, worshiping idols. The believer clings to the redemption that Jesus Christ gave for us. How he atoned for all of our sins, past, present, and future, and that we have life eternal, never to be lost, never to be taken away, guaranteed by you. We are so grateful for the sacrifice that your son made and the intercession he makes now. I pray that as we go throughout the remainder of this week, that we would go with Jesus' name on our lips, boldly telling of the best thing that has ever happened to us. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.